and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good sister into the temple. Previ previously... Through all, through all of the insanity that she that she is familiar with, as w as well as her induction into the inner circle that it that is Geek Watch, and more <laughs> relevant for tonight, the continuation of the Lightbringer saga with Gen with Lightbringer Genesis Volume Two currently on Indiegogo, the one and only Iron Liz. How Thanks for having tonight? me, Mildred. That's a hell of an intro. <laughs> yeah, I um. Maybe I, maybe I could maybe I could get a second job in Vegas as a as a Michael Buffer <laughs> stand-in. <laughs> Either way, it's cl I'm glad to be back, and I'm glad that you, uh, that I can can revisit the monastery again because yeah, it's always a it's always a pleasure to chat. <laughs> yeah. So, first off, congratulations on managing to get Volume One out. Thank you. And th Hi. and thank you again and thank you again for um for for will for being willing to reach out to. Do this for volume two as well as well as as well as join the ranks of of my temple. Well, absolutely, and thank you for having me. I mean, I, I just I enjoy chatting with people, and you and I have like chatted for I don't know what ten years now, <laughs> on and off. So uh, it's uh, like there, were, there yeah. was a long there was a long period of off when I could when I couldn't went during a point in time where I couldn't find you. But... Yeah, I kind of went high. I went dark because I I was. Thinking but, of getting off the internet, but yeah. <laughs> but I, but I do, I do recall the the whole thing when you were when you were streaming on Twitch and I was shit talking mm -hmm. you back and back and forth. <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, that was that was me just seeing what I could get away with. So yeah, it was fun to to sort of reconnect. Mm -hmm. So, but I I suppose the I suppose the first thing to to come off with was how. How much champagne was getting was getting popped after after volume one was finished? I mean, honestly, not as much as you would think. Just because it's it's more like running a marathon. Like once you're done, you just sort of take a you know like a an exhausted you know sigh of relief that it's like okay, we finally got it out, it's over, and then it's like, <sighs> you know, the, the, I think for me celebrating was getting the artwork finished and on time because we ran into issues, you know, and. Uh, you know the shipping costs went up, and you never know the unseen issues that you run up into. Like you're aware of the things that you're aware of, but there's always a, a bunch of lurking problems that uh, just have a way of slowing you down and eating up way too much time. So I think for me, once it was finished, it was like, okay, we got that done. Now, uh, holy crap, what's the next one gonna look like? <laughs> so it's no rest for the for the wicked, and um, I definitely. I'm of the opinion that yeah, you got to move fast on this stuff. So I and, felt bad that we were delayed, but we got it out. So yeah, and um, well, <laughs> you know the four rules of planning, right? As, What's that? As stated by Captain Cold, make the plan, execute the plan, expect the plan to go off the rails, throw off, throw away the plan. Mm-hmm. Ah, <laughs> uh, or. Or the or the first rule of combat that they don't teach you: intelligence is always wrong. Right, or it's uh, the Mike Tyson. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. So <laughs> it's like very true statement in that way. So mm -hmm. you know, we when it comes to anything that I do, I always want to stick the highest level quality I can on my name. Right, like I don't want to half-ass things, mm -hmm. and it's I can definitively say that you know when you're first effort to anything there's always going to be things that you look back on ret like retroactively and go oh shoot i wish i had more money or i wish i had more time or i wish i had more stuff to do that but the good news is is that when when it comes to the second campaign where we've taken what we've learned we've honed the skills that we've got of we've created and we've we've pushed it forward so you know um our art quality i think has definitely improved our uh, timeliness uh, for how we're operating through the campaign instead of just going through, okay, we're going to finish, we're going to uh, 
do the inked pages. Then we're going to send them off to Anthony to do the, the lettering on that. We're kind of doing it all in real time. So the moment that Dean finishes the page is the moment that it goes to Anthony for inks, and then he does the lettering. So we're doing this all at once, um, kind of assembly line style, so that we don't get delayed. And um, as for my own self, as the writer of this thing, um, I've really pushed myself to improve. So I've got the third the script for, for the third one, uh, about 90% complete. Um, but I've also kind of dabbled a little bit in with uh, TV show and script writing, just a little bit so I can b properly pace it, uh, make sure that the uh, the dialogue is flows a little bit better. Um, and, you know, when we found out in the first campaign, for example, that we thought, well, as far as the falling action goes, we could use an extra page. So it's that sort of thing where it's like, okay, so for, for next time, how can we improve that so it doesn't cost the campaign more resources? So, yeah. yeah. And a, com a common um, a common pitfall that can happen when, you're, when someone's following up is the idea that they need to expand. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, guess I'm guessing it's through that, through the lessons in script writing that you, that um you endeavored to avoid that issue. Right, right. And and especially when it comes to comic books for example, right? You start out with, "Oh, I'm going to stop the 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 purse snatcher or the mugger." And then somewhere down the line it's like, "Okay, now we have to stop the existential threat to all life in the galaxy." <laughs> right? It it's there's upping the stakes in the, a lot of the ways that that story writers do that is by making it more grandiose or, or increasing the scale of it. So let's let's threaten the planet and not just a, a city or a continent anymore. So I, I've avoided that. Uh, and the story is still very, like, small uh, contained. Mm -hmm. So eventually it could get to that level, but certainly not in the first 24 uh, issues that I've sort of mapped out. Not written yet with the scripts, but uh, I've done the the treatments for all those so yeah you you probably have a mind map some, somewhere that ha that has a bunch of this kind of stuff <laughs> <laughs> well definitely i mean when it comes to writing a proper story you do want to plan it out just a little bit because if you're writing it on the cuff it's just not going to flow as well you're not going to have as well uh thought out plot lines and then yeah pacing can get all janky too so you know especially with the lightbringer story um there's elements of what I have in mind that I want to sort of incorporate into uh, the setting I would have for my tabletop vampire <laughs> uh, universe that I would create. So um, a lot of that is making it suitably subtle enough to not give it away. But um, if and when that tabletop system actually happens, I can point to it and say, well, here's an example of the uh, of the world that we're living in. And here's here's examples of this and that so don't want to give too much away but yeah note to self i i need to intro i need to introduce you to um the red room one of these days okay i'd I be down for that I what, 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 what's their story about um not not story but but um the the um husband and wife team who who run that particular ttrpg studio okay um, they're more known for the they're more known for their wretched verse and one of them is Wretched Darkness, which feels like an, which is very much an OSR esque, -esque take on World of Darkness. So I think you'd get, mm -hmm. you'd get on with them. Oh, um, definitely. Also, also, I, I already told, I already told you about the, um, my whole, my whole thing with with Lost Lord, and now, and the fact that I'm now working with Mark Ryan Hagen, the yeah. Godfather. Oh, of you did yes. I, I actually spoke with him. Um, is he He's, still in Georgia or? Last I checked, yes. Okay. Uh, which may, which makes it a special kind of hell set, setting up interviews with him because of time mm -hmm, zones. Because of the time zones. Yeah, no, I, I actually reached out to him um, and uh, spoke with him a little. There was a point in time where I was kicking around the idea of talking about White Wolf as a company as sort of like a documentary. Um, so I reached out to him and he's, he's down to talk with people. And uh, it sounds like you know how he how he put together masquerade and how he kind of came up with all the mythology and how they'd done him dirty afterwards it was just yeah it was a fascinating chat with him and he's he's doing honest to god really good work for in georgia for you know for all the <laughs> virtue signaling that goes on these days he's actually walking the walk so more and, props um, to him i do i do know that i i do know that some 
even even though it had to, even though it had to get um, pulled back at the last minute, um, the the universe that he that he's creating is still is still is still being is still being worked on. It's just the mechanical mm -hmm. stuff that seems to be the focus right now is um, Fang Knight. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I was listening to him do streams of those at some point a couple of years ago. I did. I did. Well. I had my I had my streams where I had where myself Zan and um and him had talked about Badlander, which is kind of an if Fang Knight is analogous to Vampire, mm -hmm. Badlander is analogous to Hunter. Okay. Um, I know that he has other, I know that he has other plans for things that are and, and I say analogous, but that analogous isn't isn't. It isn't a, it isn't a one for one thing. It's just, it's just dipping into similar material, mm -hmm. um, and f well, with Fang Knight, you have va you have vampires as knightly orders, which I think I think is an interesting way to do it. So, and yeah. I I know it'd be tempting to bring up vampire dark ages, but I <laughs> don't think it applies. Sure, it's too the only the only thing they'd have in common is medieval times, and that's it. And <laughs> and even that and even that doesn't want to work because. Mark seems to want to go for more Renaissance st style um, in terms of his era instead of high medieval. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you're you're kind of going more towards a, uh, a Warhammer fantasy style instead of a Dungeons and Dragons style, unless you count, unless you don't count the the AD and D stuff with some of the firearm stuff they did. But I digress. Well, I could I. I've I have I have my infamous rant about what sort of fantasy D and D is supposed to be, if it and how people saying that you can use it to run any kind of fantasy are full of shit, but that's <laughs> a whole other story. Mm -hmm. um, now, with with that kind with that kind of thing in mind, what just from a writing perspective, what were what would mm -hmm. you say were some of the learning experiences you had with the Maiden Voyage? Well, on the writer's side. <clears throat> I think the I think it all surrounds the campaign because I think for me as a writer if this was just purely a vanity project if I wanted to just produce a comic book and have it be done and have it be out there um I could do it for a lot cheaper than running a campaign so the worst thing in the world for me as a creative person is putting together something that you work really hard on you pour your creative energy into you feel like you've got something really cool there and then nobody gets to read it and nobody gets to see it so i think as a writer um balancing the business aspect aspect of it for the marketing to get get an audience for it is just as important as the content itself so if you do want to make it so that you just you're not living with a mona lisa in your closet you do have to relearn other skills that you may not encounter as a writer. So I think that was very valuable. Um, I think that in the future, if I want to keep doing this to expand stories, I probably have to get up on the horse of doing st uh, streams myself. Um, so, you know, but the good news is to that is then you, you draw a larger audience. So unless I, <laughs> unless I can sell some movie scripts or something uh, and, and people get my name that way, if I decide not to engage on social media, there is an opportunity cost to that as well as a create, you know, doing creative efforts. So, oh, yeah, that was an interesting experience just because I, <laughs> as I kind of mentioned, I, I wanted to get off the Internet just a little bit. I wanted to kind of shrink my online presence. But ironically, that served to be. You know, my old online presence was one of the things that helped sell that product. So, again, if we're referring to those as products and stories, I think would be a better thing about it. Uh, Lightbringer 1, as a story, I thought was pretty solid, and it was reviewed that in similar light. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, there's, there's a level of machinery <laughs> into it that I think I need to expand upon if I want to be successful in the future. Oh, so. it, did, it did give me a bit of a chuckle when I, saw that one, when I saw that for the two covers on the Indiegogo page. One of them is by, uh, by somebody I've worked with in the past, that being Barbusco Studios. Oh, okay. I, uh, good things, I hope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, okay. He's... 
I have I have a couple I I have I have some avatar art that I that I had that I had him do that I had him do uh, when he was doing commissions. Okay. Uh, and yeah, he and he's a, he's a good guy, and he and um he's another per he's another person who is not is on my is on my level of thinking when it comes to um tabletop RPGs and so and some of the traditionalist ish um mindsets i okay any anybody who anybody who like anybody who has a positive take on the book of nine swords can't be bad <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, now, i've i've talked about that in the past and how and how that particular thing is how, how that particular thing got more shit than it deserves but hmm. the th one thing, one thing that I was 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 always a bit curious about, and I, I don't think I, I, I may have dipped, I may have dipped into it before this question beforehand, and this is this is one of those things where if I have Vic again, I'll probably have to ask him about this. Mm -hmm. Um, when it came to d who's who's whose pitch was it to? To do let to do Lightbringer in the in the motif of a um, angel was that your idea or was that that was me that, that, that was me oh yes oh I always I always found it interesting that 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 was the approach that was was ta was taken now I did suffer through the ori the original the original <laughs> comic as a pun <laughs> as a punishment game and mm -hmm. um it's. Def it definitely it definitely is trying very hard to be not to be not Green Lantern. I will free I will freely admit uh -huh. that. Well, um, it takes from a lot of things, but yes. <laughs> um, truth truth be told, if someone asked me to if someone asked me to to write a to write a Lightbringer th Lightbringer um thing where I have where I have no background knowledge, I would have been ripping off Ultraman. <laughs> but that's a little that's a little bit on the nose. Yeah. But I I do th I do think I, I do remember asking that at the time. But the I think what but I think the bigger th I think the bigger thing I wanted to focus on is the ro is the Roman angel motif. I is the best okay. way to put it. Um, <laughs> what made you go with that? Of all the designs you could go with for an angel motif, what made you go with that one? Well, as far as the um, <laughs> the angel side of things, I, I wanted to bring back some very classic images of of good and evil, right? So that is the the evil side is much more expanded in the in the second one. So we're going to see a little bit more of what he uh, what Carter is up against, and as the Lightbringer and fight a, a villain of similar, <laughs> I, I guess, opposite of what he is. As far as the design to the Roman side of things, that was creative license for Vic. So I'm not, I wanted to, I explained it to him that I saw angelic creatures or, or you know, that the classic, um, like, Harbinger or, or Lightbringer as somebody that, that, that summons like an angelic idea to me. Mm -hmm. As far as the execution goes, though, that was that was on Vic. So I think we wanted to do a mixture between have it sort of set up as a soldier, but then have it set up as a sort of mystical side of things as well. So if you look at um, a lot of the old depictions of angels in the Bible, or even through um, Dogma, for example, right? They sh it shows them kind of wearing uh, like Greco-Roman style armor. Mm -hmm. So I want. I thought that was a nice callback to to that imagery as well. So and I believe that I believe the name for the, for that chest plate is mus is musculata, and that and I can hear my friends in it. I can hear my <laughs> game dev friends in Italy screaming at me about my about my bad Latin. Exactly, uh. but uh, yeah. And as far as the villains go to it, um, yeah. <laughs> If we're if we're having an angelic side of things, we're we're absolutely going to have a more demonic side of things as well too. So that'll be more explored now. The nice thing about the second book in a series is that you're it, now that you've got all the pieces on the on the board. Now that you've introduced all the characters, it's really now the second one is where things start to get interesting. So out of curiosity, mm -hmm. and this is '90s as fuck of me to ask, but mm -hmm. 
has anyone br- has anyone brought up spawn when you've when you've pitched <laughs> Lightbringer to them? Uh, as a matter of fact, um, so Vic for um, we actually changed artists from away from Vic, and that was in, largely because of uh, he he also ran a campaign um, Beowar. called Beowar. War. Yep, mm-hmm. and so he. He got to the point where he he was successful in it, but Bayo War is going to be a lot longer in terms of page count than uh, than Lightbringer. So we realized that we weren't able to. He wasn't able to do both projects, so we had to bring in um, Dean as our as our new artist to kind of <laughs> have a bit more reasonable work schedule. So when it came to describing Tanith and when it came to describing the villains of the book. Um, Yes, the idea came into so so are we do you mind if I go towards a spawn vibe and I don't want to give too much away just yet but yes that absolutely did come up. So I will I will admit it's not it's not a one for it's not a one for one thing. It's mm-hmm. this is it's more of a mix up mix of I could I could see some bullet points here and there mm-hmm. in a in a DNA sense and a bit and a bit of a bit of intuition, since Vic is is as genre is as genre savvy as I have, and, and in fact, the mm-hmm. only bad thing I have to say about Vic is that he is that he's a fan of Boston sports. <laughs> well, that comes with the territory. He lives there too, so you know, don't blame him on that. But yeah, or in that area, I think I'm not sure if it's specifically in, Boston, but he is a he is a mass hole. <laughs> I and for the record, I as cringy as that name may may sound, I did not come up with it, so don't blame me for it. Okay, I won't. But <laughs> he, but he 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 has his, he has his. But I think I think the other thing is around around that t- around that time when um I fir- when I first caught wind of it, I was exposing the animated spawn to some of my students. Okay. So. That cer- that certainly helped me put t- put two and two together. And when when I say th- when I say that kind of thing, I don't I some people will say that sort of thing as a, as a as a lead in for rip off. That's not my <laughs> approach. I've al- I've always been interested in the ancestral line sure. of, a gi- of a given work and see and seeing seeing wh- seeing the chain of events and the things that came before that led to it. Um. I did a bunch of that when I was researching the origin of what's refer what I refer to as console style RPGs, but everyone else refers to as JRPGs. Mm-hmm. Um, especially when I got pissed off when extra credits tried to claim that they were descended from visual novels, which is not true. <laughs> it it is it is so it is so wrong that words def- that words fail to describe its wrongness. <laughs> but. It's a lot. A lot of it is everybody. Creation, creativeness does not come out of a vacuum. No, there no. Is no, there is no art ex nihilo. Well, mm-hmm. that's, that's also very bad Latin. <laughs> <laughs> but every everybody is going to be drawing inspiration from something. Exactly. And. It's and it's those and it's the chain of events that led to those inspirations, which were inspired by other things. That is interesting to me. Um, mm-hmm. If I have to use a, a more contemporary example, it's how it's the relationship between, say, Zorro and Batman. Because I be, I believe Bob Kane outright admitted that Zorro was an influence. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, I think he, I think Razor Fist actually mentioned that. <laughs> and. You have a similar thing with Berserk, where the big inspiration for that was Gwyn Saga, which is the longest-running light novel series. Um, okay. It it did get it did get an anime a few years ago. Um, obviously, didn't cover all of it. That was done by um, that it was which was fa- fairly standard. Although for although somehow they ma- somehow they managed to get Uematsu to do the music. Okay. Uh, which he's the Final cool. Fantasy guy, right? Yeah. Okay. Um Practice, props to them then. <laughs> and it and it I think I think part of the reason they were able to do that is 
A lot of the cover art for the light novels for Gwyn Saga was handled by Yoshitaka Amano, mm -hmm. who's who had been who who was the concept designer for Final Fantasy up through up through up through six, and has done and has done key art for it ever since, along with doing art for a bunch of different stuff like. Um, Vampire, Vampire Hunter D, Gotcha Man, the Japanese version of the Elric books. Okay. Um, he's done a lot, <laughs> <laughs> but but it's the it's those it's those sort of elements that I always find interesting. That's why I ask those kind those kind of inspirations to see. Oh, where, definitely. Where where the method to the madness came? Well, well, certainly, and I mean, I it wouldn't be a Lightbringer comic if. Uh... If somebody didn't accuse us of uh, of paying homage slash ripping off, right? <laughs> so, I mean, the original content kind of borrows from from all the more established tropes. So, if you rip if you rip <laughs> off from one guy, it's plagiarism. If you rip off from a dozen guys, it's research. Mm hmm. Something like that. <laughs> now, it's with with that with that with that in with that in mind. One th one thing that I did find funny that you, that that you had the, that you had the brass balls to do is the is the Mulga hat. Who the, the hell's Mulga idea hat? was that? That was mine. <laughs> uh, so uh, <laughs> there's a story behind this, by the way. So so okay. So we have a uh, if you check out the campaign page, um, we have as as a potential add-on item, a Make Lightbringer Great Again hat. So you can buy the hat individually. Um, it does. It's also included in the top, the featured tier, the the top tier, the Searing Light of Justice. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, if you're interested in buying it too, there's another one that kind of gives you the comic, uh, the black light poster, and the hat. They, we call that the Spear of Justice. But mm -hmm. the story behind it goes is that the original campaign. Um, there was a YouTuber. His name is V Infuso. Now V I is know. not. Yeah, yeah. He he did a lot of the the coverage for the change the channel stuff when it came out, mm -hmm. and I still maintain that. If, seriously, check this guy's channel out because he has a a lot of really good content on it. But he he really helped bring a lot of the authenticity to the change the channel stories as they were coming out, and he kind of reported on all that. So. I reached out to him and said, "Hey, would it be all right if I, you know, went on your on your live stream and talked about the the Lightbringer remake?" And he's like, "Sure." So we go on there. We, you know, I do my thing. I explain everything out. And while the stream was going on, somebody reported it to Linkara, and Linkara flagged it. Um, and specifically, I think that stream either got fully demonetized or. I, I don't know if it was a strike, but um, it, it got V in a little bit of trouble. And so after kind of finding out about that, um, there was a discussion on Linkar's Twitter. It's like, well, so, oh, well, why are they doing this? And that's when he called me a piece of shit. So uh, in Linkar's own words, I'm a piece of shit in part because I voted for Trump. So we decided to kind of run with that and... Yeah, it's a shot across the bow, to be sure. But it's, yeah, make Lightbringer great again. So we made it great the first time. We're going uh, to we're gonna make Lightbringer great again a second time. So yeah. um, <laughs> that's kind of where it comes from. So, And if, if I can't I can't pass judgment on the on the whole thing with the hat because of <laughs> because of a stunt I, pu I pulled I pulled some some time ago where I I had made I had a red hat um, set up. But if but instead of MAGA or, or anything like that, it's mm -hmm. it just says made you look. <laughs> right, right. It gets people all riled up. Yeah. Uh, well, it was it was in the it was in the same spirit as the free T-shirts turn right gag that I did that I did a long time ago, just to make people drive in circles, just to see just to <laughs> test how how um how, how we, much you can get away with <laughs> how much I can get away with and to and to demonstrate that um. So that some people are dumb enough that they would fall that they would fall for this, um, because I, I like I like I like people who I like when people pull some variation of the SoCal hoax, uh, which the short version of that is a scientist wanted to demonstrate that certain that certain journals had no had no or little or very little standards mm -hmm. for 
uh, for um, peer review. So yeah. he put so he submitted he submitted um f- he submitted papers to that to one journal under under a pseudonym so, named Sokal. All of the stuff he submitted was complete bullshit. <laughs> and they got published anyways. Oh god. And then he re- and then he revealed I was so called you you motherfuckers need to up your need to up your game. <laughs> and I thought I thought it was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah. And it's it was the same thing with the major look with the major look thing. It was in, it was intent I was intentionally fishing to find people who would be dumb enough to fall for it. Right. And and the funny thing about it is that I've had people say to me like, "Oh, well, should we have Linkara try to receive your comic and see if he'll review it?" And it's like, "Well, I know for sure he'd probably throw it away." Uh, and um when it comes to the hat, you know, if I try to send that something like that to him, yeah, it's just it's not going to work. And I'm not interested in going after somebody or trolling them like that, right? Like just just leave them alone. Don't do that. But if somebody were to um, buy the hat and then have it signed by, or, or see if he could get it signed at a convention or something, I, I think that would also be funny. I'm not saying to do that. I'm just saying I think it would be funny. So, <laughs> um, no, no matter how, no matter how, no matter how it goes down, I will, I will just simply say, well, so instead, instead of doing that, you're spent, you're spending time breaking bread with the better Minnesotan. <laughs> exactly. Also, so also the to- also the also the one who can get things off of the high shelf. Right. So I mean, like all politics aside, realistically this is about telling a good story. Yeah. And you know, what I like about Comic Skate in particular is that you're able to explore the things that you want to do without being constrained to studio or or publisher oversight or or political meddling right Mm -hmm. so um that's the aim and i'm not trying to sell you uh (laughs) a a pro-trump comic book i mean there's certainly uh comic book uh companies out there that do that stuff but but realistically it's it's about taking the lightbringer story as it existed in its flawed state and just giving it the proper treatment it needs because there are some decent ideas in there so Mm -hmm. yeah and I've seen I've seen a bunch of people say that we need that we need a RPG gate, and I'm I'm sitting, I'm sitting there going, I've been here the whole time, fuckers. <laughs> exactly right. Like it's, I I think I think when it comes to RPGs, it's a little bit more difficult um, because there's a lot more money that goes into it. You have there's to make tables. Yeah. Parts, pe- there's a lot more pe- moving parts. Right. Um, period. And exactly. Part of the reason I do what I do is to try is to try and. Uh, mitigate the issue, mm-hmm. which I've been do, which I've been doing for, I've been doing, re, I've been doing my own, re, my own thing when it comes to that, that for like I think, I think nine years by this point, it'll, it'll be ten, mm-hmm. it'll be ten years in twenty twenty four. Yeah, and the th- there's always, I've al- there's always been that mantra of ex- of expand horizons or show or show what's out there in the in this particular temple. Mm-hmm. Um, and hell, the reason I the reason I call it a temple is because this this is a sacred ground where all of all of the politics, all of the strongly held beliefs, all of that stuff is absolutely meaningless here. Mm-hmm. The only the only thing that matters is the game. Exactly. And, is it any good? And that's what you should judge things on. So, and I've, I've I give every I give everybody their their fair shake, and and when if I it's very it's not all that often where I where I outright slam a TTRPG that I find mm-hmm. there there can certainly be a good amount of mad, but in terms of outright bad, my standard for bad to the point of ranting is the unholy trinity. <laughs> okay. The unholy trinity is Senzar, World of Cinnabar, and of course Fatal. Oh um, yes, of course. <laughs> I've heard some. I've heard some people bring up Raythulu in in it, but Raythulu is unfinished, so I don't count it. Mm-hmm. But oh, well, and you'll notice a lot of those ga- a lot of those games are years old. <laughs> like right. Like in turn. 
and the the only other time that I that I get an like at worst I might get annoyed like I like I was for say Cowboy Bebop or Av or Avatar or um or or Power Rangers, but that's but that's main that's mainly when you have a strong IP that you can do a lot of stuff with and you piss on it, mm -hmm. or you or you make decisions that are very counterintuitive. Um. And ju just use an example with the Avatar Legends thing, they decided that you should not be able to that you should not be able to play as the Avatar in that. Oh boo! And their reasoning was some things should remain mysterious. I countered with you are you are leaving up you are leaving so many storytelling opportunities on off the table by doing that. Yes, I would agree. Especially especially since in. Especially since there was another, there was another avatar like that also was based around the powered by the apocalypse system called, um, age called um, um, Le Legend of the Elements, which was originally just called Avatar Hack, but they had to nix all that when they went legit. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> One of the playbooks in that is their avatar equivalent. Okay. So. Of course, so, yeah, so there's a question of if they if they can do it with half the with a third of the budget, why can't you? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And one thing, one thing that I um, one thing that I was a bit that I was a bit curious about when you were do when you're doing the scripting. Mm -hmm. Um, I've spoken with I've spoken with some folk who do have a background in TV, and one concept that was brought up to me. Is the concept of a series Bible, okay? Which is a document that contain that contains every character, every character that's going to be relevant, the relation, the bullet, the bullet points that are important to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. When you're when it came to constructing Lightbringer, did you have a similar document or something close to it? Um, not written down, but I have found as it's it's good that you bring that up because I've used something like that where if I'm thinking about characters and I'm thinking about who they are and what their motivations are and what have you, um, what I did instead is I got like a little three by five note cards, put a character's name on it, and then put the traits on it for, for what they are. And on the back side, I put the story arc that I had in mind. So I had, you know, like a handful of cards to begin with, though as the story kind of like I said, uh, I, I think I have probably a 24-issue arc in mind um, that I would play out over time. And more cards would certainly get added to that. And then characters that sort of make uh, um, appearances in, in the first or earlier issues would become more fleshed out over time as well, too. So, for example, there's a, a throwaway story um, that's like a single issue adventure for the homeless guy that uh, Carter gives cigarettes to um, in the first book. So he would be a more involved character in subsequent book, uh, comics. Now, at that point, certainly I would bust out the card and then put that down so I could keep that in mind. But as far as like writing out a grandiose story, that would be more involved with the scripting. So I suppose... <laughs> um, that's probably as close as I would get for the series Bible if I were if I were gonna do it that way. So, mm -hmm. and I'm not. And realistically speaking, too, I do have a a gr a much bigger um, story arc in mind. So I'm I'm breaking it. A lot of the pacing al is already doing a lot of that for me. So, and part of the reason I do I do ask that, and this is also the reason oh, I did I lose you. Oh, I think I might have lost you. Discord oh, really doesn't like me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yep, you sort of went silent there. Yeah. So, but <clears throat> the this is this is the reason one of the big reasons why I asked about the about the series Bible and also the whole expansion thing is mm -hmm. you you brought up scale earlier, but th which could be considered the horizontal. Could be considered a horizontal issue if it go if it goes too high, mm -hmm. um, or rather not horizontal, vertical. What the hell am I thinking? But <laughs> there's also the horizontal issue of what of what can happen since 
some some writers can get vi can get tempted into adding way too many characters as as a work um, progresses. Mm -hmm. Also known as Robert Jordan syndrome. <laughs> and when it comes to when it can't, when it comes to the development of Lightbringer, have you even even if you're able to even with this arc that you have planned, have you made sure to keep to um keep a tight leash on how many how many characters get added to the mix? One hundred percent, definitely. Um, what I discovered in the first one is that it takes time to introduce a character because you have to give them you know you have to explain their motivations, you have to explain what they're doing and who they are and the rest of that. So if you want to develop a fleshed out person, you have to devote pages to that. So um, I don't want to keep adding new people, but for certainly in the second book, following the original series a little bit more closely, uh, Detective Crane is coming into it. So we're going to have him in there. But beyond that, there's some side background characters, but they're not as important. And um, we can, a lot of the motivations will be explained over time anyway. So when it comes to the bigger, when it comes to just a lot of characters, I see it growing more organically over time as the, th initially I have it set for there's going to be three, uh, or excuse me, five three episode arcs, right? Mm -hmm. To follow that arc. And then in between a three episode arc, there's two kind of, throwaway stories right they're the, the the single issue sort of thing um or self-contained so by the time you get to the 24th one though you're gonna have um those five minor villains or the the big bad at the very very end uh you're gonna have more of the development in the city because you want to spend some time in pharaoh city so you can develop it and and make it a, a unique place you're gonna see that and yeah, you're going to see the main heroes and the main characters and some of the minor ones and how they relate to that, to that lived in se uh, uh, setting. Mm -hmm. So um, the goal is at least <laughs> to create a situation that, like a comic book story arc, you build it up over time so that you can raise those stakes just a little bit, but not so big that it becomes ridiculous. And I think after 24 issues, I would create a scenario where the city itself becomes potentially threatened, but not by a giant space laser. Because that's always what happens in these things, and uh, that's copping out. So the the threat to Pharaoh City, following the the kind of spiritual or you know metaphysical side of Lightbringer, that, that motif would come more into play. More about the people themselves uh, losing faith, losing hope, doing things that would be detrimental in the long run and taking the easy path. Mm. So I don't want to give too much away on that, but again, uh, yeah, it, it, it's going to be a while if I can ever realize that vision. So, Yeah. Now, with the, with that in my, with that in mind. Uh oh, did I lose you again? <laughs> God damn it! I'm cursed. Oh, you're back. Okay, can you hear me, or am I just talking, or or is it not working? I can hear I can hear you. It's just it's just I th I think I think there's I think there's an issue with my headset. I'll have to address later. Um, okay. Now, on, on the matter of Far of Faro City, we uh, we've talked a lot about characters, but mm -hmm. one thing that I'm curious about is is if you approached Faro City as if it was a character. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think <laughs> so. Being a uh, good Upper Midwesterners that we are, um, you can argue that Gotham City is unique in its own way, as is Star City, as is um, <laughs> uh, Themyscira, and all of these other places. They have def defining characteristics about themselves, but they also have culture, they also have people that are unique to that city as well. So, being from the Upper Midwest, one of the things that I saw, especially in you know Wisconsin or Michigan, was the idea of the dying Rust Belt uh, factory town. Uh, so, my my parents were born in a small town in northern Wisconsin that used to be a factory town, and um, 
the factory is has been dying for 30 40 years now so that is a unique situation and scenario or or culture i guess then you would see somewhere like uh, new york city by example because everybody every big city in these stories is either new york or chicago or L- or, or la but i think there's something very midwestern about that and so that's something that I wanted to try to incorporate into certainly the first story. Um, I think uh, when the second one is, is definitely more uh, connected to the, the, the heroes and the events with that, but certainly with the, the resolution to everything in the third one, um, if we can get to that point, uh, we're very much going to have it um, where the city itself becomes a, a bigger player. Because, again, you get to decide what kind of life you live. And if you have one for hope and you have one for thinking that there's going to be a better future and a better tomorrow, you're going to work towards that. You're going to want, you're not going to give up. You're not going to um, slip into your base instincts. You're, you're going to work hard, even if it's difficult, even if there is, you, you may not be able to see the results initially. So. That, I think, is Lightbringer's big, biggest strength as a superhero, and I'd like to catalog that transformation over time as well to Pharaoh City. Yeah. And plus it's, plus it's so, nice to see... Hopefully that answers that question. Oh, yeah. And... Uh-oh. Car says, We've been foiled again by your difficult <laughs> headset problems. It's, Zounds! <laughs> it's nice to see a... A, um, a city that isn't that isn't an XP for a co- for a coastal city for once. Mm-hmm. Because you you look at a lot of these Gotham City is I know a lot of people say New York with it, but in my opinion, it's got more in common with Boston. Hmm. Um. Obviously, because because it's where he grew up. Ha- half of the, half of the Marvel universe is in some in some borough of New York. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um. Oh. But, and of course, of course, of course, it's ju- it's just as bad on the on the coast side of th- on the coast side of things. But the U.S. is a very big place, and there's ve- and there's a bunch of and there's a bunch of other cities that can be utilized. And I've I've made I've made clear in the past one reason I became a fan of um, John San- John Sanford's work, especially mm-hmm. especially his Lucas Davenport novels. I have way too many of them. They they were probably they were probably the closest thing I had to a reg to a regular pulp novel because we didn't grow up in the pulp era. Mm-hmm. Was the fact that he, that so much of his work was centered around Minnesota? Okay. Uh, Devon Davenport was bit was a. Uh, it was it was a detect it was again the closest thing we ha- I had to a detective pulp serial. Yeah, um, with the pre- with the prey novels, and a lot of it a lot of it centered around around Minnesota. Okay. Um, not ju- not just the Twin Cities, but it, but all o- all over the place beyond that. Um, in some in some movies in the nineties, they just it. I appreciated how some of them decided to set themselves in in the Twin Cities. As bad as Jingle All the Way is. That movie yeah. is a scavenger hunt for me because because I can look at that and go, hey, I know that place. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Or um, I think Mighty Ducks was also oh, filmed. Yeah, um, to the point where to the point where they had they had scenes at Mickey's Diner. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's right. <laughs> uh, and I remember I remember watching a, a um a show in Can- a show in Canada called Continuum that. Did a did a similar thing, but for Van but for Vancouver, to the point where they actually, they the show itself was soundtracked by local artists in the in the Vancouver area. Mm-hmm. And it's that it's that it's that variety that that is appreciated. Not every not every story has to be in has to be in New York or Chicago or Los exactly. Angeles. Exactly. Dear God, dear God, not Los Angeles. I do not want to deal with LA traffic ever again in my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, LA was was uh, ugh, horrible. <laughs> um, I've I had hear I would hear horror stories my whole li- my whole life about LA traffic, and then I finally did. Then I finally saw it for myself the one year I was at E3, 
Okay. And um, they were all underplaying how bad it is. Well, I was amazed by the the squalor, like the <laughs> you know, just everything falling apart. Everything just looked like yeah, like I've I've lived in the Caribbean before, um, and there wasn't nearly as much just rot and urban decay um, that you saw in a developing country like uh, Curacao. So that was that was pretty shocking. Uh, I've incidentally when we're, when it comes to towns where where um pl- where stories have taken place, I've I've I have main I have maintained for the, for the lo- for the longest time that it would be that it would one that one particular city that is underutilized when it comes to storytelling is the Big Easy. Hmm. Whether whether doing it blatantly or some or some kind of some kind of um, legally distinct version of New Orleans. Well, see, when it comes to New Orleans, a lot of vampire lore is ironically put there. Um, I wasn't going to uh, go with vampires. I was going to go with voodoo. Well, that too. Um, there's certainly it's certainly got a a mystical vibe to it. And uh, when I was down in Mississippi um, and Gulfport, specifically along the coast. Um, yeah, we went to to Nola, and it was definitely it would definitely be a very good site where you could do superhero related stuff. Certainly, um, it was a city that was was definitely um, in decline, or at least its heyday was behind it. Um, so there's a lot you could really do with it if you felt so inclined. So yeah, I I think you're right. <laughs> yeah. Now. As I as I understand it, you're shooting for around tw- around twenty four ish pages. Uh, thirty two. Thirty two. So my bad. Mm-hmm. And is on the on the um, Indiegogo page, it said that you're about two thirds complete. Is that st- is that still the case, or have you got or have yep. you gotten a bit further in since? Well, um, right now we're having Dean work on a cover, so that's. That is slowing him down just a little bit, um, but we are absolutely making progress with it. Um, so I, I suspect once that's done, we'll be able to post some more images. Um, he's also getting, I think he's just recovered from from illness as well, so he's <laughs> he had a bit of a backlog. But yeah, we're, we're moving right along. As far as the campaign goes, um, we've got 11 days left in the first month. We are going to re-up it for a second month, but we're at 38% as of the tonight. Um, so we're make it, we're in good progress. So certainly we need everybody to, to help if they can, or at least pass around the uh, link just because Indiegogo has uh, shadow banned us. Mm-hmm. So we will not show up in searches. And if you want to support the campaign, uh, going through the, the direct link is how you do it. So, yeah. um, Incidentally, I I I should have asked this early early on, but of all of all the things to of all the things to arm Lightbringer with, what made you go with a spear? <laughs> oh, see, I'm gonna sound super nerdy, and you're the first person to ask me this question. But um, you're gonna sound super nerdy on a nerd podcast. Uh huh. So, why a spear? Well, a spear. People initially go to oh, it's got to be the spear from. Uh, you know, Christian mythology where 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 Christ was was pierced with his... no no no, no nothing like that, no. right right nothing like that. Um, I happen to be kind of a a little bit of a fan of Undertale and um, the uh, the the character Undyne um, or Undine Undyne the Undying. Uh, she uses a spear and uh, I I really liked the um, the music battle against a true hero mm-hmm. and that. The spear side, yeah, that that really, I liked it a lot. Where I I wanted to use it myself. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I've seen some animations of people kind of putting together what they suspect the fight would be, would look like in that. And there was one in particular that stood out. And um, yeah, I I really that really spoke to me. So I thought instead of having a sword and board, instead of having uh, you know like uh, the the light powers that he had where it's like oh i can reshape objects with my hands out of light uh no i wanted to have it be uh spear combat is one you don't typically see and uh, it can be just as brutal if you know what you're doing yeah, so when 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 you can s- well there's a there's a reason why everybody was afraid of the swiss for a few years because of those pike formations mm-hmm. 
yeah, the Lunch Lunchacht. I can't say Lunch, it correctly. Lunchnacht. That's a that's a German thing. That's a that, yeah. That's a that's an HRE thing. But uh, uh and the, and their whole thing was be, was being mercenaries who got double pay because they were in the front lines and looked and dressed um ridiculous even by the standards of the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> especially especially the you've probably you've probably seen the cod pieces that were going on with oh, Lunchnacht. Yes. Um, <laughs> I know it'd be. I know it's tempting to make. D- on one hand, on one hand, is it? On one hand, it's it could be considered lowbrow to make dick jokes. But is it really that lowbrow when so many of them look like fucking dicks? Right. <laughs> oh, they knew what they were doing. They had. Oh, they had to have. They knew. So. They knew exact. They knew exactly what they were doing. That's the sole reason. The sole reason that they would that Lanchnex would dress so ridiculously colorful was. Mm-hmm. Was a um, flex, yeah. You know, because they're because they're in the front lines, getting twice the amount of pay and being able to keep it. Because, oh, re- remember, you can you can keep your pay as long as you as long as you live to payday. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you're good enough to survive. So, and uh, my one of my one of my mentors always said, "Winning isn't everything, but there's always gloating." <laughs> very very true but with the, with all that said i do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time to venture all the way back to back to my temple and oh absolutely <laughs> take the take the particular anointing to be to be one of the good brothers and sisters here yeah we absolutely have to do it again sometime cuz uh it was too long so <laughs> but and of course, any time you see fit to return, whether it's for, whether it's for Geek Watch, for Lightbringer, or ju- or just to shit talk about about whatever comes to mind, um, mm-hmm. the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>